The Lost Crystal Skulls. Legend tells us there are 13 of them left for us by an ancient civilization or even from beings not of this world. You have an artifact that seemingly can't be made by humans on this planet. They are objects of rare beauty and a universal symbol of death. You look at it and it's glowing. Of the handful of skulls that have been found, most are human-sized, carved of quartz crystal, and believed by some to have strange powers that baffle scientists. The moment you carve a crystal into a skull, something happens. The crystal skulls are made from the same type of material that we now use in our microchips. Together, they are said to contain the secrets of the universe. Secrets that some claim will save mankind from an Armageddon prophesized by the ancient Mayan calendar. It tells us the world will end in 2012. Many people believe that 2012 signifies cataclysm. Over the millennia, some of the skulls and their secrets have scattered to the four winds. And legends tell us they must be reunited to prevent the coming doomsday. With time running out, can we track them down? Our journey leads us from the jungles of Central America to a barrier reef loaded with sunken treasure and all the way to the moon. The question, of course, in my mind was, did the astronauts bring it home? As Indiana Jones prepares to enter the kingdom of the Crystal Skull, join us in a real adventure. Wow, so this that's what I wanted. I wanted to be able to say, hey, there's Crystal here. With the clock ticking, can we track down the remaining skulls before it's too late? I feel that there's, there's something underneath the ground here. Join us as we attempt to solve the mystery of the Crystal Skulls. Hello, I'm Lester Holt. This is where the mystery of the Crystal Skull begins, amid ancient ruins in the tiny country of Belize. Like a real-life Indiana Jones, British adventurer F.A. Mitchell Hedges and his daughter Anna claim to have discovered a human-sized skull made of quartz during an expedition in the 1920s. It was the first of 13 ancient skulls said to exist. Tonight, we are going to retrace their steps in an effort to find the one still missing and perhaps finally explain the mystery of the Crystal Skulls. Here in the jungles of Belize, it's 90 degrees, 90% humidity, and 100% grueling for an American adventure seeker named Bill Holman. We have to watch out for the alligators. I feel that there is something here. Officially, he's trying to retrace the steps of a famous explorer. But little do the people here know, he's searching for his personal holy grail. He's going to track down a missing crystal skull. Yeah, this is an opening. This is a doorway. And I hope I'm going to try to open it up and see what's down in this thing. There are several legends swirling around crystal skulls and their origins are shrouded by the mists of time. Some say the crystal skulls were carved by Maya artisans and offered to the gods. Others say the skulls were created by an ancient and advanced civilization like Atlantis. And there are those who believe the skulls are extraterrestrial objects left here as crystal repositories of great knowledge. Now, although this might sound at first a little far-fetched, one has to remember that the crystal skulls are made from the same type of material that we now use in our microchips. And if you think of the amount of information that we now store inside a tiny quartz crystal silicon chip inside a computer, just think how much information might be stored inside a crystal skull. Only a handful of scientists have been able to examine the crystal skulls, and the results of these experiments are mixed. It's only increased the mystery and controversy surrounding the skulls, leading some to claim the skulls are fakes. The various crystal skulls 
not one of them has any real documentation as to where it came from. To classify these skulls is very interesting because science, which we're dealing with now, the sciences of anthropology and archaeology, they can tell us very little. Basically, uh, you can't date crystal. Although there are thousands of crystal skulls in existence, some coming in spectacular shapes and colors, most of the experts we spoke to agree there are a total of 13 ancient crystal skulls. These skulls are thought to be thousands of years old. There is a general consensus that only eight of the 13 ancient crystal skulls have been discovered, and this expedition has been launched to find one or more of the missing skulls. I feel that there's still a number of crystal skulls still left. I'm just kind of drawn to this place. If you haven't heard much about crystal skulls, you're not alone. They've occupied an obscure place in popular culture. They first appeared in newspaper articles in the late 19th century. Archaeologists began to study them soon after. By the mid-20th century, crystal skulls were on display in the British Museum, the Museum of Man in Paris, and the Smithsonian. A small number of books have been written about the skulls. And television programs like Stargate Atlantis have explored the legend behind these mysterious objects. This is incredible. All of that obscurity is about to change now that Harrison Ford fights the powers of evil to get his hands on a crystal skull in the new movie Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. If there was ever a real-life Indiana Jones, then F.A. Mitchell Hedges would be him. He was tall, swashbuckling, a true adventurer. Here he is in the 1920s, hat on head and pipe in mouth, standing on the docks, watching as his boat is lowered into the bay. Soon he would be sailing off to British Honduras, now known as Belize, for an expedition. He really went out there into remote areas. He searched for lost cities. Uh, he lived with Indians in the jungle. He believed he was discovering evidence of Atlantis. And it makes a lot of sense that someone like him would ultimately come into possession of the famous crystal skull. His adopted daughter, Anna, says she found the skull while her father was excavating the Maya ruin known as Lubantun. Just before my 17th birthday, I went for a climb. And the sun was very, very strong. And I saw something shining back in my face. And I got very, very excited. So I went and told my father. And the following morning, before I got up, he had everybody getting to move the stones from the top of the building. And then uh, when the hole was big enough, I was let down with two ropes and a light on my head and on my shoulder. And that's where I had found the crystal skull. But instead of giving the crystal skull back to the Maya, Mitchell Hedges is said to have spirited the skull out of the country. The year was 1924. 84 years later, this man, Bill Holman, is the keeper of the world's most famous crystal skull, an object so valuable he keeps it locked away in a safe in his hometown in Indiana. But as Bill travels from the United States to Belize, he is convinced that authorities there will seize the original skull if he dared to carry it across the border. Do you remember the first time you came to this site? Uh, I remember the, uh, I came here with Anna Mitchell Hedges. Yeah. Here at Lubantun, Bill Holman unveils yeah, an right exact here. replica of the Mitchell Hedges skull. Replica. Yeah, can I take a look at it? I'd love to see it. Like you say, the original is in two pieces. It has the, the bottom half jaw, and it's hinged to the top half. This right here is exactly a replica, so you can see. It's the same size. Same size, same shape. Exactly, but if you check out the workmanship, it even has the little ridges that a human skull has. And, and what do you say to those who just don't believe the story of, of how it was found? Well, you know what? You know, I'm very happy with everybody's story. You know, it doesn't bother me at all. I want, you know, everybody to, it's good to have their opinion, you know? Very few scientists have had a good look at the Mitchell Hedges skull. 
In the mid to late 1960s, Anna Mitchell Hedges loaned the skull to an art restorer, the late Frank Dorlin. And just before she arrived to get it back, Dorlin sneaked the skull into the Crystal Laboratories at the Hewlett Packard Corporation. Dorlin was able to immerse the crystal skull at the Hewlett Packard Labs in a special alcohol solution that was the same gravity as the quartz crystal itself. With that, they were shining lasers and special lights into the crystal skull to catch the faceting and the, the axis of the skull. And what they found there was that the skull had special light wells built into it that channeled light into the eye sockets and the mouth of the skull. Dorlin concluded that if the Maya had created the crystal skull, it would have taken them 300 years of constant polishing and rubbing. But they could find no evidence of any kind of tool marks, either hand tool marks or, or machine tool marks. And that's what led apparently one member of the team to say, this skull shouldn't even exist. Interest in the electronic properties of crystal is not confined to a band of skull enthusiasts. NASA scientists have been experimenting with crystals for decades, trying to discover new ways to build high-speed semiconductors. NASA wanted uncontaminated crystals, and the best place to grow them is in zero gravity. But there may be a darker side to these tests. There are things government deems so dangerous, it will not reveal them under pain of whatever. Richard C. Hoagland is a writer, researcher, and former NASA consultant. He sees a link between these NASA experiments and the tests performed on the Mitchell Hedges skull at the Hewlett Packard Labs. The optical properties of Mitchell Hedges indicate that someone was giving us clues that there's complexity here. It appears to me, from my reading of the analysis, that it was literally synthesized, fused together in a, in a process that would have required zero gravity and maybe the deliberate growing of the crystals. The question Hoagland and others are asking is what kind of advanced civilization was capable of designing and carving a crystal skull? When it comes to crystal skulls, you get as many opinions as you have people. You know, everybody has their own opinion. Bill Homan's opinions come from the source. He met Anna Mitchell Hedges in 1981, and despite a 30-year age difference, the two were married in the late 1990s. As he got to know Anna, Homan grew transfixed by the story she told about her famous father. And we arrived in Belize, and we went into the jungle, which was very difficult, and we arrived uh, near Lubantun, and my father tumbled on a stone there, and he shouted to the world, we can't be very far from this lost city. What inspires me about Mitchell Hedges is, uh, in this day and age, there's no real heroes, okay? Mitchell Hedges and the Mitchell Hedges, they are my hero. You know, they're someone that you can look up to for something they've done in their life that they believed in, and they gave their whole self for it. Over the years, Anna shared many of her most guarded secrets with Bill. Stories hinting at the unfinished business her father left behind. Anna handed Bill original documents, never before seen photographs, and hand-drawn maps, all pointing to the location of buried treasure still languishing in the ruins of faraway places. And then, before she died in 2007, Anna handed Bill her most prized possession, the crystal skull. You know, at first, I wasn't really sure what to do, but it seems like it's something that comes through you and takes over you. The Mitchell Hazard crystal skull is the most powerful skull that we have available at this moment in time. Dr. Jaap Van Etten is an author and crystallographer. He spent a considerable amount of time working with the Mitchell Hedges skull and many others. And it is for most people very clear that at the moment you carve a crystal into a skull something happens and that something is defined as the energy of the crystal is moving in frequency von etten believes he knows the ultimate source for the crystal skulls 
According to his incredible theory, aliens place the skulls directly on the intersections of what are called vortex lines, areas of the Earth where powerful gravitational energy exists. These so-called hotspots include the sites of the Great Pyramid in Egypt and Stonehenge in England. Van Etten believes the crystal skulls were deposited around the globe from Denmark and France to Turkey, on to China, Japan, over to Hawaii and the Western United States. And then the crystal skulls were scattered, lost for thousands of years, until a few were discovered in the last century by Mitchell Hedges and others. The legend also says that by the time that we are ready to really access that information, we will be at a certain point of our evolution, and many people believe that this is the time frame that we are in now. The crystal skull legends point to an upcoming date, one set by the intricate and amazingly accurate Mayan calendar. It's a time when the world may come to an end. The date is December 21st, 2012. Many people believe that 2012 signifies uh, cataclysm. John Major Jenkins is an expert of the Mayan calendar and the 2012 phenomenon. He is convinced the crystal skulls will be activated on that day and they may prevent an apocalypse. The legend goes that the crystal skulls are reunited at the end of the cycle. We have to remember that skulls were symbols of, of death and death is the portal to the other world. It's kind of a twofold thing that humanity will awaken to the problems it's creating. And it's a time of warning also that if we continue on our current path, we will end up as skulls ourselves. That means the clock is ticking. All of the original 13 crystal skulls must be found and in place before 2012. Bands of crystal skull believers are gathering. Skull experts are researching, measuring, and in the most unexpected places, people are focusing intense energies on the crystal skulls. Staring into a crystal skull is fine for some people, but Bill Homan is a man of action. Along with his son, Brett, Homan runs one of the top karate schools in the country. He's an eighth degree grandmaster. Karate, to me, it's a way of, you know, having setting your goals. You know, you want something, and you see what it is, and you take the steps it takes to get there. And the steps Bill Holman is going to take to find a crystal skull will be difficult ones. There are 13 crystal skulls in the legend. By most accounts, eight of them have been found. Five are still missing. No one on Earth has more of an inside track on where to find the others. He's got the records. He's got accurate photographs. He's even got a map. And with Sci-Fi Channel's help, he's got a plan worthy of his late father-in-law, F.A. Mitchell Hedges. We're going to Belize. We're going to be looking for crystal skulls. According to the Mayan legend, there's still a number of crystal skulls down there. Still ahead. A grueling hike leads to the unexpected. Have we stumbled on the remains of Atlantis? This changes our notions of history and civilization. Also ahead, why some think the government isn't telling us about the connections between the skulls and extraterrestrials. Is it possible that the folks at Area 51 figured out how to talk to this thing? But first... A dangerous voyage, upriver and into forbidding territory. Tracking down the remaining skulls before a Mayan calendar doomsday. When that time arrived, the skulls would be vital to the survival of the human race. When Mystery of the Crystal Skulls continues. For Bill Holman, the race is on to find at least one of the missing ancient crystal skulls. A race to prevent a possible Armageddon. The quest is deeply personal. He's determined to fulfill the dying wishes of Anna Mitchell Hedges, who is said to have found the skull here in southern Belize in 1924. She always believed there were other skulls here. Uh, good morning. Welcome to Podagora. Belize is a tiny country located between Mexico and Honduras, 
with a population of just 300,000 people. But at the height of the Maya Empire, millions of people lived and worshipped here. The Maya were without any doubt, you know, one of the preeminent civilizations of the New World. And, and I say this because the Maya were the most literate society in the New World. They recorded information, they wrote, they had books. And they built spectacular sites like this ceremonial pyramid at Altun Ha. It's beautifully restored, and you can see the skull images carved into the ancient rock. But most of the country is dense, tropical forests, an archaeological mystery waiting to be solved. Day one. Bill's first mission is to explore the Maya legend that the Mitchell Hedges skull was made here in southern Belize. He's determined to find a local source of quartz crystal. He heads to the tiny town of San Pedro, Colombia, just down the road from the Maya ruin Lubantun, where the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull was found. Hello? Hey, I'm looking for Leonardo Acal. Have you seen him? You know where Anna he Mitchell Hedges says she worked with her father in this village. She told Bill that San Pedro should be his first stop if Hello. he ever decided to search for a crystal skull. And there was an old friend of hers that Bill should track down. His name is Leonardo Acul, and he's a key figure in the crystal skull legend. He's one of the spiritual leaders of the Mayan people. And he's been studying with all the old masters all his life. And also, his grandfather was on the expedition with Mitchell Hedges. Anybody home? Is Leonardo here? Leonardo, how, how are we doing? <laughs> how are you doing? Good to see you. Leonardo is a direct descendant of the Maya. He appears to live a simple life. His wife cooks over an open fire pit and animals roam freely in the yard. But this quiet, unassuming man reveals to Bill how the Maya came to possess the crystal skull. We call it Sakitok. That's, that's the original name in Kekchi Maya language, Sakitok. Sakitok means crystal. As with all legends, there are differences. The Maya version, according to Leonardo, says the gods descended from the sky and handed a crystal skull to a mere mortal. This skull contained the secrets of the gods. Through prayer and ritual, the Maya were able to extract knowledge from the skull. And this is how they learned to craft the other 12 crystal skulls. The Mayas are just like us today, but they are more knowledgeable, they're wise, they're very intelligent. Since that time, the crystal skulls have been linked to Maya ritual. So here is the scenario that people might have seen. You're now walking into a Mayan temple, and the priests then guide you to the inner sanctum, and sitting on an altar, glowing among firelight and torches, is the famous crystal skull. And you look at it, and it's glowing. The so-called paranormal properties of the Mitchell Hedges skull have intrigued researchers for decades. But until Anna Mitchell Hedges died in 2007, the skull was strictly off limits. Bill. Hi. Glad to see you, Dale Walker. Oh, glad to meet you. It's really Bill Homan is trying to change all that. Weeks before he left for Belize, Bill arranged for some tests to be conducted with Dale Walker, one of the leading figures in the international crystal skull movement. First skull I worked with was the Mitchell Hedges skull. We were able to take this really clear quartz skull and bring images up which could be photographed. For the first time, we were able to photograph images, true images, like, like graphics coming out of a computer. For Walker, the pictures were shocking. He believes he has captured fragments of ancient civilizations trapped in the crystal. He's even caught glimpses of what appear to be extraterrestrials. Walker has photographed hundreds of skulls since, but his life changed forever in 1987 when he came into possession of his first ancient crystal skull. I felt an energy that I had only felt before with the Mitchell Hedges skull. It was an unusual feeling, sensation, led me to immediately think that this was a real skull. 
He's here today to test a hypothesis. What would happen if he placed his ancient skull next to the Mitchell Hedges skull? Walker thinks when put in proximity, the skulls may actually create and transmit energy. He's brought along two contemporary skulls for control purposes. So that the, the three skulls surrounding it are in triangulation. This is called a tetrahedron energy grid. In order to test the level of energy released by the skulls, Walker positioned Bill Homan in front of each one. Okay. He recorded the scene with a thermal imaging camera, which measures ambient temperature. We know that uh, quartz crystals are able to generate a bioenergy field within individuals. Uh, we think it, it, it occurs because they grow just like other biological objects do, like plants, animals, and people. To his amazement, Walker discovered that when touched by human hands, the skulls produce a form of energy which registers on the thermal imaging camera. When Bill places his hand on the table, the temperature registers a cool 62.4 degrees. But when Bill touches the Mitchell Hedges skull, the temperature spikes to 82 degrees. For Walker, this is clear evidence that crystal skulls possess an otherworldly energy. The conclusion is simple. It's not heat that's transferring. It's transferring a type of energy that generates heat in the body. We keep coming back to the question, where did these skulls come from? Could Maya artisans have crafted these life-size replicas of human skulls? And if they did, where would they have gotten the large pieces of crystal? Well, some believe the answers lie right along these riverbanks. Early the next morning, the local Maya spiritual leader, Leonardo Akul, leads Bill Holman to the banks of the Columbia River. Let's go, let's go. Leonardo knows of a spot five miles upstream where large chunks of quartz crystal are rumored to have been found. The only way to get there is in one of these dugout canoes. There's alligators in here from what I understand, so we have to watch out for the alligators. When Mitchell Hedges went up river back in the 1920s, it was a far more menacing journey. There were swarms of mosquitoes, rough waters, and pounding rain. Things got so tough, in fact, the hardened explorer was forced to turn back. By the time we reached safe ground, it was almost dark. We were covered in thick clay. Mosquitoes droned around us in millions with that most hateful of all tropical sounds. So began a dreadful night. Sleep was impossible. As Bill and Leonardo battled their way upriver, they faced the same thick swarm of mosquitoes. And several times, Bill gets out of the boat and drags it over the rocky bottom. After many hours, they finally arrive. Chris? Hi, I'm Christopher. You must be Bill. I'm Bill. Glad to meet you. I've heard a lot about you. They're met by an American couple, oh, Christopher Nesbitt and his wife, Dawn Dean. They run an agricultural research farm here. Leonardo brought Bill to this site because many people, including Dawn, say chunks of crystal can be found right here in the riverbed just below the farm. I found this crystal in the river. Right over here, I found a lot of them about the size of a grapefruit, but then some of them even as large as, say, a cantaloupe. So you mean about the size of a, a crystal skull? It's hot and humid, and the bright sun makes it difficult to find the right type of rocks. All right, mostly right ahead in here is where I have found crystals. Mm -hmm. The Maya were very secretive about the source of their crystals. Could it be hiding here in plain sight? Like this rock here, that could, that could have it. That could have it. Wow, that's a nice shape, that isn't one. it? Yeah. Wow, look at that. The only way to find out if crystal is inside is to break open the rocks. They pound rock after rock, splitting them open, only to be disappointed. And just when they're ready to give up. Hmm. Wow, look right there. Look at that one, right down in there. Look at that. Wow. That's lots of little round ones. Yeah, but see how, look at how, colors. yeah. It's beautiful. I think that crystals were seen by the Maya and many Native American groups as a special kind of substance. In some 
traditions, it's thought of as solidified light. That's pretty, that's good. The crystal Bill found in the river isn't quite big enough to carve out a life-size skull. But to him, it's clear evidence that the Mitchell Hedges skull could have been made nearby. We're one mile from uh, Lubantun with crystal. You know, if there was crystal here, I'm sure that the ancient Mayans would have been able to find it oh, yeah. and would have been, been able to use it. Coming up, cracking the secrets of the skulls. Will it explain a host of other ancient mysteries? The crystal skulls appear to be produced by a technology that we can't reproduce. Perhaps the answer is located far, far away on Mars. What we saw was a mesa that looked kind of like a quirky face. Back on Earth, finding an ancient Maya city, or is it evidence of Atlantis? There's something underneath the ground here. When Mystery of the Crystal Skulls continues. Having found a source of local quartz crystal, Bill Holman now has a lead on where one of the original crystal skulls may be hidden. He's learned from his trusted Maya source, Leonardo Okul, that there's an abandoned ruin on this property. It's a site called Ushbantun. And according to Christopher Nesbitt, it's somewhere at the top of this mountain. It's probably a suburb of nearby Lubantun. Um, and it's an area with a lot of terraces, housing terraces, house mounds. You can point at all the different hills over there and they all have ruins on top of it. So up the hill they go. First, they have to pass through a dense grove of trees. The heat and humidity is withering. The thickness of the forest, claustrophobic. That's a big bamboo. Even the ants here are mean and nasty. He's got a big head, very powerful jaw muscles. He's got spikes on his thorax that'll make you bleed, and he can cut right into your skin. A little sucker's bite. That is the amazing thing about this hike. As Bill and Chris climb up and up the mountain, tiny bits of the ancient Maya past jab at them from underfoot. Cut stones, hints of an outcropping. From here on in, it's going to be bushwhacking. Bill suddenly realized he was literally climbing up the side of a pyramid. At one time, there were thousands of people living with, within eyesight of here. This is a very inhospitable place to, to have a city and urban environment. Ushbantun is a logical place to search for a crystal skull, since it shares many similarities with Lubantun, the site where the Mitchell Hedges skull was said to be found. The curved edges there are rumored to be identical to those found at Lubantun, so is the manner in which the walls were built. Lubantun may be actually older than other Mayan cities. There's something special about it. It's near the coast. It was possibly uh, a Phoenician port city, and certain ports like Lubantun and Tulum were essentially Atlantean ports. In other words, Lubantun and neighboring Ushbantun may have been part of Atlantis, the lost continent from Plato's enigmatic tale. Atlantis, a powerful empire thriving thousands of years before the dawn of civilization. Plato is pretty specific in saying it's out in the Atlantic. Well, as you go into the Atlantic, you have the Azores, which are part of Portugal. They are part of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. But as you go farther into the Caribbean, you have islands like Cuba, the Bahamas, also islands like the Bay Islands off Honduras. All of these places were on the mind of Mitchell Hedges when he originally set sail for Lubantun. He believed this ancient site was Atlantis, and he hoped to find archaeological evidence to prove it. Is the crystal skull that proof? Is the crystal skull an artifact from Atlantis? If so, it would blow a hole in the accepted theory of human evolution. 
Mainstream historians are telling us that civilization is only five or six or seven thousand years old. The story of Atlantis is saying that civilization is older than this. Civilization is going back 10, 20,000 years. If civilization is that old, and maybe the crystal skull is that old too, then this changes our notions of history and civilization. And some researchers believe if we could crack the code that is written inside the crystal skulls, then we may find the answers to ancient mysteries. They might tell us who built the monoliths at Stonehenge, or explain the strange figures cut into the earth in Peru, called the Nazca Lines, that some say were created to be seen only from outer space. The crystal skulls appear to be extraordinary emblematic artifacts produced by a technology that we can't reproduce. And we have to now go back with 21st century technology and find out what it's trying to tell us. Connecting the dots between ancient astronauts and mysterious objects like the crystal skulls is an all-consuming passion for Richard Hoagland. He's a former NASA consultant, and for the past 25 years, he's been investigating and heatedly challenging the U.S. government. His new book is titled Dark Mission, The Secret History of NASA. Ignition, liftoff. Hoagland began building his case after the 1976 Viking 1 mission, which went in search of life on Mars. And they were passing over a northern region, a northern desert of Mars called Sidonia. And they photographed this very strange looking thing. Well, what we saw was a mesa that looked kind of like a quirky face. That quirky face is now known as the face on Mars. The image created an international sensation. It was a humanoid face, indicative of a potential human civilization that had once lived on Mars, that had built amazing structures in its immediate vicinity that look eerily like pyramids. It's a mind-blowing theory, an ancient civilization thriving on Mars millions of years ago. Hoagland continued to study the face. As he did, he began to piece together a truly revolutionary theory. This face on Mars, 35 million miles away, may have been replicated by an ancient civilization on Earth. It has a left and a right half. The left half is feline. It looks like a lion. The right half is hominid. And we find on Earth, particularly in the Mayan cultures, we find all kinds of artwork where you have a fusion of two creatures. In the Maya world, mythology and astronomy go together. And various mythological deities represent astronomical features. So for the Maya, the Milky Way was thought of as the great mother in the sky. And the center of the Milky Way galaxy would have been her, her womb, the place of rebirth. Hoagland believes this ancient civilization was not confined to Mars. It probably was a solar system-wide civilization, in which case they may have also left stuff on the moon. And that stuff on the moon, claims Hoagland, was made of crystal. There's this incredible crystalline geometry arching above the moon surface, and there's this incredible set of brilliant beads along the surface that can only be refracting because they're chunks of glass. Using a computer, Hoagland claims he is able to enhance official NASA photos. What he sees are remnants of incredible structures on the moon's surface, enormous towers of crystal, spectacular crystal domes. The moon, a massive crystal outpost of an ancient civilization based on Mars. Then, Hoagland says, galactic disaster. Mars got smashed. Mars is a place which underwent an incredible, horrible catastrophe. The impact reverberated throughout the solar system, sending debris hurtling into the moon. Imagine the moon as an archaeological site. 
All we are left with, says Hoagland, are shards, ruins, blasted artifacts. What was left was an incredible submerged remnant of an incredibly advanced civilization. At the side of a crater investigated by the Apollo astronauts, Hoagland saw another mysterious object. It was, it was a head. It looked like a robot. It looked like an artificial life form. To Hoagland, the robotic head seemed eerily familiar. He'd seen him before. Could this amazing artifact be a kind of robotic brother to the crystal skulls? Imagine if you have an artificial life form which had a power source, which was killed, but whose head, brain, memory circuits, computer, whatever you want to call it, is in perfect preservation in a vacuum. The question, of course, in my mind was, did the astronauts bring it home? But if the astronauts actually encountered fantastic remnants of an advanced civilization, or perhaps even a robotic head laying in an ancient blasted crater, why hasn't NASA told the world? Hoagland believes NASA has sworn the astronauts to secrecy. And perhaps for good reason, national security. A few years after the National Aeronautics and Space Administration was formed, it commissioned a study from the Brookings Institution. They came up with a document that in April of 1961 was submitted to Congress that unadvised public disclosure of this evidence could lead to the literal destruction of civilization. NASA has refuted Hoagland's claims and refuses to comment on his allegations. Still, Hoagland wonders if NASA has been working to unlock the secrets stored inside objects like the robotic head and the crystal skulls, searching for prophecies written by a lost civilization. If you were one of these ancient, incredibly sophisticated cultures, and you knew that terrible things were going to happen to the planet, and you wanted to leave libraries for the, your future descendants so they could reconstruct what it was that had happened and how to avoid it, Maybe that's the mode that you would choose. As incredible as Hoagland's theory is, it sounds remarkably similar to stories told in this small village in southern Belize. The legend tells us that the crystal skull is not made by earthly men like us here. It comes from an alien world. We say it's an alien because they are not like me and you. These aliens are from the different dimensional world. Whether guided by alien gods or earthly ambition, Bill Holman is nearing the top of the mountain. Underneath his feet is an ancient Maya pyramid, the lost city of Ushbantun. Didn't you say that some of the, the like a king or a, some of their family might be uh, in this the, area? The theory that I've heard from archaeologists is that a branch of the royal family lived here. As he neared the summit, Bill could feel the presence of the ancient Maya. It's around this time that most explorers start to think about the curse surrounding crystal skulls. There are some who say that perhaps the crystal skulls are cursed. Um, in fact, Frederick Mitchell Hedges described his skull as the skull of doom and said that it had been used in ancient ceremonies to will death. Okay, Bill, well, this is about as far as we can go without actually hacking a new trail. I'll hand you off and let you go. According to Christopher, the top of the pyramid is up there somewhere. So Bill will have to hack and hack his way through the tropical forest. Finally, Bill stumbles onto something. It's a tiny exposed wall. He's found just a piece of the ancient city of Ushbantun. I feel that there's something underneath the ground here, especially when you can go around and you see the different openings and look in. You can see that it opens up into like a room inside. So there's more to it than just a pile of uh, stones and rocks. This entire mountain is a giant pile of rocks, and any opening Bill could find is not big enough to squeeze through. 
He didn't expect to even find this place, and local law prevents any unauthorized digging. He'll have to come back another day after getting a permit, and that could take months. And I feel that there is something here. I feel that if I was able to dig here, you know, just having that feeling and being here, it sure makes you want to find it. As for Leonardo Akul, there is more to this mystery. He sees the link between Bill Holman and F.A. Mitchell Hedges, the man who first came here in search of lost treasure. Leonardo says the time is right to reveal another secret, and it's something Bill Holman has been anxiously waiting to hear. Um, yes, there is another crystal skull buried not too far from here. In the next hour, we widen our search as the hunt for skulls brings us onto the high seas and a spot littered with buried treasure. We're going to go down and scour the area and see what we can come up with. But with underwater currents threatening... It's a little dangerous, too. ...things are about to get rough. Yeah. And an ancient prophecy drives the mission. The Mayan calendar foretells cataclysm in the year 2012. They believe that the skulls are emerging now to change the course of humanity before it's too late. With Mystery of the Crystal Skulls continues. Like the incredible adventures of Indiana Jones in the movies, real life adventurer Bill Holman is on a mission. Here in Belize, Bill is hoping to find another crystal skull. One similar to the skull purportedly found by Mitchell Hedges more than 80 years ago. Maya legend says the skulls contain the secrets of the gods. Others believe the skulls will reveal profound wisdom from an advanced civilization said to have founded the lost continent of Atlantis once the code is broken by finding all 13 skulls. So the search is on, and Bill has just received a tantalizing promise from Leonardo Akul, his friend and a spiritual leader to the Maya, who still live here in Belize, on the lands their ancestors inhabited centuries ago. Leonardo knows where another skull is hidden, and he will take Bill to it. But first, Bill will have to be patient until the time is right to go there. With limited time, Bill decides not to wait around but to travel to the island of Roatan, just off the coast of Honduras for a couple of days. Mitchell Hedges lived on Roatan for seven years in the 1930s, and Bill says there is some evidence that he may have even found and hidden a second skull on or around the island. Local diving legend Doc Radowski knows more about these waters than anyone. When Mitchell Hedges came here and was working here, it was very primitive. There were no roads, everything moved by boat. There was no electricity, no running water. Pretty much like Treasure Island uh, in Robert Louis Stevenson's book. Buried treasure also attracted Mitchell Hedges to Roatan. For centuries, Roatan had been a base for pirates. The most famous and most wanted was Henry Morgan. Morgan robbed Spain's Caribbean colonies during the late 17th century, even seizing Jamaica from the Spanish and converting it into an English colony. Over time, dozens of ships were lost. In Roatan and around Port Royal, there's probably treasure to be found. The amount of buried treasure is probably anybody's guess. Lee Matuta was just a kid when Mitchell Hedges arrived. He was staying on the key digging. Digging the tree up, looking treasures, and found tree out on chest of money. The old timers here believe that Mitchell Hedges struck it rich, hauling up three treasure chests full of gold doubloons. But he is also said to have found something even more valuable, hidden within a local cave, a fantastic object made of crystal, possibly another crystal skull. As the story goes, when the authorities try to stop him from taking these treasures out of the country, Mitchell Hedges is said to have thrown one of the chests and the crystal skull into these waters. And now Bill Homan is here to look for them. Yeah, we're in the site of a sunken 17th century ship loaded with Spanish gold right in this area. 
Much of the gold was taken off and placed in chests buried by the pirates. F.A. Mitchell Hedges was here and he located some of the chests. And we have metal detectors. We're gonna go down and scour the area and see what we can come up with. This will be a new adventure for me. The anchor is set as we suit up and dive in. Who knows, if we don't find a skull, maybe Bill and I will find some doubloons. As we scour the grassy ocean floor, we enter a world many have never seen before. We glide over and around the ancient wreck, but no sign of treasure, and the current is becoming stronger. But then, something happens. Bill points the metal detector over some large chunks of the old shipwreck. The needle spikes, but just for a second. It doesn't look as if anything but bits of a picturesque wreck is buried here. And this current is tricky. It's so strong, it's dragging us away. Unable to stay positioned, Bill and I meet at the top. I sifted the sand there where I thought I saw something, but it's really hard to know. It's, it's a little dangerous, too. There's a lot of... Uh, jagged edges. I, I'm guessing there's a lot of undiscovered stuff in this area, given the amount of, of history and warfare that took place here. After struggling against strong currents and limited visibility, we've come up empty. It was a long shot anyway. But Bill has a surprise, a hand-drawn map showing another possible location. Anna Mitchell Hedges was here in 2002, and when she was here, she gave me some ideas where her and her father might have lost or left some treasure. And I want to go back to that spot, and I want to see if we can find it. Is it far from here? I mean, did she give you a pretty good uh, ID where it is? Yeah, it's, it's uh, right across the bay, so it's not too far from here at all. That's it. Bill is still on the hunt, still consumed with adventure. But he isn't the only person obsessed with skulls and their power. A world away, Joanne Parks, owner of Max, the second most renowned skull on Earth, will soon be presenting him to a devoted audience. I'm bringing Max to New York City for a magical, mystical event at the Meta Center. Joanne, from Houston, Texas, has been traveling with this skull for the last 21 years. She believes the skull has tremendous healing powers. Max, the skull came to my life through a major, major shift. We met a healer through a family medical doctor in 1973 when our 12-year-old daughter had been diagnosed and was dying of bone cancer. According to Joanne, her oldest daughter was given only three months to live. She says a llama named Norbu Chin used his skull to try to help heal her daughter. They would chant and talk to Benton to the skull and claim they communicated with it. Between the monk's work, the creator's work, the skull's work, they did give her uh, extension on her life for three years. She lived for three more years very well. Just before Norbu died, he gave Joanne his crystal skull. Since then, she has conducted numerous ceremonies with it. I want to welcome all of you to being here this evening and joining Joanne us brings Max to people who want to draw support the skull's supposed spiritual and healing powers. Max did for me what no human could do. He helped tap into me and bring me out of a deep dark pit, a five long year deep dark pit over the lith of my daughter and helped me to express myself through him. He's here to help people along on their own spiritual path in their own ways. Back in Honduras, Bill continues his own quest. He is anxious to see where the hand-drawn map given to him by Anna will take him. We're just off the shores of Roatan, and as best we can tell, where X marks the spot on the Mitchell Hedges map, the water here is about 30 feet deep and crystal clear, perfect conditions to hunt the treasure. Mitchell Hedges dropped overboard more than 70 years ago. Though the waters are clear from above as Bill dropped into them, visibility quickly becomes a problem. The current is stronger than before and it's hard for Bill to get his bearings. And down here, he must be extremely alert. This area is known for its sharks. But nothing is going his way, and we quickly realize we have hit another dead end. Maybe it's just not our day. 
But Lee Latuta believes there's another reason Bill came up empty. The treasure is cursed. It is challenging, sister. You can't get it. If you want that money, you got to break that enchantment. You either got to kill a rooster. That's what they say, kill a rooster, a white rooster. But you got to cut him, his neck off over the hole and let the blood drop down into the hole. And then you will get it. Enchanted or not, Bill has one more lead to follow before returning to Belize. Anna has also left him two photographs. One shows the entrance of a cave. The other is a picture of the hills and shoreline on the nearby island of Helene. Perhaps the treasure and skull are buried there. Just ahead, we go into the lab to find out what science tells us about the skulls and the possible connection to extraterrestrials. It would put out all kinds of sensory phenomena. And later, our expedition lures us into a tight spot, a claustrophobic nightmare, when Mystery of the Crystal Skulls continues. Bill Holman and I have been following Mitchell Hedge's footsteps. In Honduras, we dove for pirate treasure, and Bill tried to track down another lost crystal skull underwater. And he will soon be returning to Honduras to follow clues in a mysterious photograph left to him by Anna Mitchell Hedges, a photograph depicting the site of a cave where a crystal skull may be buried. Now, back in Belize, Bill continues his quest. We have returned to Luban Tun, the place where the Mitchell Hedges skull is said to have been found. And I have a few hard questions for Bill, hoping to get to the bottom of where the skull ultimately came from. You've come here with Anna before. She remembered pretty much everything. It's changed a little bit since, you know, the, when she was here, they didn't have quite all the, the different pyramids and covered and everything, but she was able to go through it and point out pretty much different things that they found and where they found them. Anna claimed that one day during the 1924 expedition to Lubantun, she climbed to the top of a pyramid, looked down, and there, lying beneath the collapsed altar of a temple below, she spied a shimmering crystal skull. Now, the actual pyramid where she was lowered down into, that right. pyramid doesn't exist? Well, what they did is they've somehow taken it down. She said that uh, it you know, was a large pyramid, and uh, they took, kind of took the top off of it. You know, I never take anything for face value. I always try to weigh it out. She never wavered from what she said of finding it here. It left no doubt in my mind that she was here. She did find it. But were the Maya capable of making such an incredibly intricate object? I spoke with Dr. Jaime Awe, director of the Belize Institute of Archaeology. Do we know if the Maya worked with crystal? Oh, certainly. Um, we have found crystal objects in some cave sites that I've worked in. So, yes, you know, to the Maya, crystal was, was a very important, very interesting, very significant type of rock. Did they have the technology to create something like the crystal skull? I am totally convinced that the Maya were capable of producing these types of objects. Still, Jaime Awe doubts that the local Maya crafted the Mitchell Hedges skull. And though Anna Mitchell Hedges claims she found the crystal skull at Lubantun, Awe and other researchers question her story. Anna does not appear in any of the published sources about Lubantun. I don't know that she was ever there. Can you go out just a little bit? Sure. In fact, Jane Walsh, an anthropologist at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., uh, thinks she knows where it came from. Mitchell Hedges purchased the skull at Sotheby's in London in 1943. I have copies of the catalog when the sale took place. I know how much he paid for it. But Bill Holman has a different interpretation of that story. He says Mitchell Hedges had left the skull with a friend, and the friend's son had put it up for auction. When Mitchell Hedges heard about it, he rushed to Sotheby's. And Mitchell Hedges got there, but he, he could not get it out of auction because it already had been put in, and it was already listed. 
so he had to bid on his, on his own skull to get it back. In the past, Walsh has examined some of the most famous crystal skulls, two at the British Museum and one in the Smithsonian's own collection. Welcome back. Using an electron microscope, she first took images of an ancient stone carving. She says that the ridges look rough and irregular because the artists used primitive tools. Essentially, pre-Columbian carving, Maya, most or if not all Mesoamerican people use stone and abrasives to carve. Now, look at this image taken of one of the skulls. Notice the perfect parallel ridges. Walsh believes these marks appear to have been made from a diamond rotary saw. That would indicate that the skulls could not have been made before the late 1800s. To learn more about the possible age of the Mitchell Hedges skull, Bill Holman brought it to Jane Walsh for testing at the Smithsonian. I took some silicon molds of some of the carved elements of the skull, which I later looked at under a scanning electron microscope. They indicated to me that it was carved using quite modern equipment and high-speed polishing tools and certainly not consistent with the story that it's pre-Columbian. So does this mean the Mitchell Hedges skull is not one of the purported 13 ancient skulls? Not necessarily. Some crystal skull experts see those same tool marks as evidence that a civilization vastly superior to our own must have made them. And they mention other scientific tests that disclose some incredible characteristics. Remember the Hewlett-Packard laboratory test done by Frank Dorland in the 1970s? In that examination, the reported properties of the Mitchell Hedges skull seemed miraculous, almost otherworldly. Frank Dorland, who studied it for Hewlett-Packard, actually came to the conclusion that the skull might well be over 12,000 years old. And what he found about the crystal skull completely amazed him. He found that it would put out all kinds of sensory phenomena, from sounds to smells, and that particularly the skull would actually glow and light up at certain times. And they also discovered that the skull was made from a particular type of quartz known as piezoelectric uh, silicon dioxide, which we now use in all our electronic devices for information storage and communications. So maybe there's something in the original legend that said the skulls are containers of great knowledge or means of communication between the worlds. So think of it as a kind of a solid state CD a three-dimensional CD, and the optical properties of Mitchell Hedges indicate that someone was giving us clues that there's complexity here. You should preserve this, you should iconize it, you should worship it, you should keep it safe until you have evolved the technology to read what it says. One of the most interesting things that, that, that some people say they've seen inside a crystal skull is the image of a UFO. Up next, we enter a sacred Maya site where the ancients made a dire prediction about 2012. For the first time in 26,000 years, the Earth is lining up with the galactic center of our Milky Way galaxy. A coming cataclysm that only the reuniting of the skulls can prevent when Mystery of the Crystal Skulls continues. Several of the most famous crystal skulls have been examined, yet more questions have been raised than answered. Anthropologist Jane Walsh believes the Maya were not capable of fashioning crystal skulls. Other researchers say the skulls could even date from the time of the legendary Kingdom of Atlantis over 10,000 years ago. First mentioned by the Greek philosopher Plato, Atlantis was purportedly a mighty power that conquered much of the known world. Plato said it was located somewhere beyond the Pillars of Hercules. Supposedly, the Atlanteans had a very high technology. They built giant ships. They built giant cities and ports and things like that. They would have been able to work with crystals and create 
crystal skulls. But ultimately, the story of Atlantis ended in tragedy. At the height of its powers, Atlantis is said to have sunk beneath the sea in a day of terrible cataclysm. Where did they go? Well, the whole idea is that there are earth changes. Occasionally, the earth goes berserk, and there's huge earthquakes, huge tidal waves, tsunamis, volcanoes go off. In 1923, just before Mitchell Hedges' journey to Belize, famed psychic Edgar Cayce proposed that the Atlanteans used a mysterious form of crystal energy as a power source. Stories of this fabled civilization originally drove Mitchell Hedges to Belize. He was a believer in Atlantis, and he felt also that there were vestiges of Atlantis in Belize, in Honduras, and in certain islands of the Caribbean. And being the kind of character he was, he was determined to prove this. They'd heard rumors of a lost city said to be still buried deep in the rainforest, and he was determined to find it. He hoped that he might find evidence of the lost civilization of Atlantis. What Mitchell Hedges stumbled upon was Lubantun. Lubantun is unusual because it's not built with cement like other Mayan cities. It is built out of perfectly cut rocks, much of them megalithic in size. And Lubantun is therefore unlike other Mayan cities. Which led Frederick Mitchell Hedges to wonder whether if perhaps the people who built the city of Lubantun were perhaps survivors from the Atlantean civilization. If so, they may have had a type of cultural memory of that civilization's destruction. For the Maya also believe in recurring cycles of creation and destruction. And they created a calendar to reflect them. The Mayans were such a mysterious culture, and they were obsessed with astronomy and the calendar and time. It was a cyclical calendar. It went through great cycles. It was way more scientifically accurate than our own, based on the actual movements of the planets and the stars, and they used it primarily to make predictions. The Maya believe the first cycle began in 3114 BC. And one of the most frightening predictions the Maya made was that the current world will actually come to an end in the not too distant future. The 13th cycle, the last one, is coming soon. I'm standing at the site of an ancient observatory. The buildings here provided a fixed location to observe the sun, moon, and stars. The stelae, or vertical stones that surround this plaza, cast a shadow to a central point, marking the exact date of the year. On December 21st, 2012, this stella will cast a shadow marking the end of the Mayan long count calendar and perhaps, according to believers, the end of the world, or maybe the beginning of a new one. December 21st, 2012 is the end of this great cycle of time in the long count calendar. It's basically targeting a very rare astronomical alignment. For the first time in 26,000 years, the Earth is lining up with the galactic center, the center of our Milky Way galaxy. Some believe the alignment could actually cause the magnetic field or polarity of the Earth to reverse, causing major upheavals, massive earthquakes, huge volcanic eruptions, and violent climate shifts across the globe. And they have happened in the past. Scientists say the last reversal occurred about 790,000 years ago. Whatever may occur in 2012 could be directly related to the crystal skulls. The Maya were obsessed with a particular god known as Itzau Na, and he was the god of the Earth's axis. He was represented with the image of a skull, perhaps a crystal skull. So this has led many people to speculate that perhaps the end of the calendar will be associated with some kind of shift in the Earth's axis, and that this might be what the Maya were talking about as the end of the current world. But according to an ancient legend, this doomsday scenario can be prevented if all or most of the original 13 crystal skulls are reassembled and their awesome power is released. The galactic alignment is going to set these crystal skulls resonating. They don't all have to be uncovered. 
in order for this to happen. Uh, so we might actually find that uh, some of them will start announcing their presence. Could there be any truth to this tale of doom or deliverance? Can inanimate crystal hold any powers? A couple of weeks before Bill left for Belize, he decided to put those powers to a test. He journeyed to Sedona, Arizona, a place famous for its red rocks and as being a source of unknown and mysterious energy. Bill is here with the actual Mitchell Hedges skull, not the copy, to see if it has any special properties. Being in Sedona, you're in one of the most beautiful places in the world, and the energy here is, is very, very special. And they have these different uh, vortexes all through the area. Author Yap Van Etten is an expert on crystal skulls. He is also an authority on earth energy lines and vortexes. Yap has invited Bill to Angel Valley Ranch, a potent vortex site. So we're going to go set the crystal skull in the center of it, and we're going to do a ceremony that activates the portal at that point. It's supposed to send the energy through the world. We believe that the crystal skulls work through the different Earth energies, through the different grid systems of the Earth. So by going to places of power, and activating the skull, we activate those grid systems. We are with 12 people, and the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull is considered to be the 13th. So we represent, you can say, within this ceremony, the 12 other skulls. We will literally represent the energies and draw them in to the best of our abilities. Interestingly, Native American legends also venerate the crystal skulls. The Native American version of the legend says that there are 13 planets in the universe that are inhabited by human life, and that there is one skull for each of these planets, and a 13th skull that will one day connect all the various elements of the human race that are spread across the cosmos. And in an example of art imitating life, the cosmology and myths of the Battlestar Galactica television series also mesh with those of the Native Americans. There's a 13th colony of humankind, is there not? Yes. The scrolls tell us a 13th tribe left Cobol in the early days. They traveled far and made their home upon a planet called Earth. Just ahead, a tip on another skull leads us to a remote island and into treacherous territory. Oh, oh. Also ahead, why some say the skulls are at the center of a government conspiracy of silence. Can we learn the truth before the Maya doomsday of 2012? It's a time of warning that if we continue on our current path, we will end up the skulls ourselves. When Mystery of the Crystal Skulls continues. Bill Holman has immersed himself in the mysteries of the Mayan calendar and its dire end-time predictions. He has taken the Mitchell Hedges skull to Sedona, Arizona to tap into sacred power points. And now, for the last time, Bill returns to the Bay Islands of Honduras. He has a photograph left to him by Anna Mitchell Hedges. It could lead him to the location of a lost crystal skull. Just to the east of here is the island of Helene, which is almost as wild today as when Morgan the Pirates sailed these waters. It's a place also known for its many caves, and in one of those caverns, Mitchell Hedges is said to have hidden another crystal skull. That idea keeps driving Bill forward. And it was made of pure crystal. It was uh, enchanted by the natives. They said it was enchanted, so they left it down there and they reburied it in a different location. So it's still down there. Anna gave Bill two photographs taken by her father in the 1930s. One is of the coastline. The other depicts an entrance to the cave he desperately wants to find. There's a lot of people you can meet down there, and they have the stories. And we're going to meet the right people, and they're going to be able to bring us to some of these treasures and these things that are still down there. One of those people is local caving expert Ron Ryan. 
Bill has given Ron the photo of the coastline, hoping Ron may be able to identify the area and lead Bill to the caves nearby. We navigate between the mangrove swamps and the shore, and finding the spot is harder than it looks. It's been more than 70 years since the picture was taken, and almost everything has changed. We're looking for caves. Most of the caves that seem to be right in the middle of this ridge, okay. right in the middle of the hills right there. So if there is a cave, it would be right there. Ron finally thinks he's found it. Looks like a rock right there. Amazingly, he's at the exact spot depicted in the photo taken by Mitchell Hedges in the 1930s. <laughs> That'd be it. There's a hill right here. It just goes up. My God. But as Bill prepares to go ashore, there is resentment brewing back in Belize. My personal belief is that crystal skull should be brought back to Belize and either they put it into the museum or maybe displayed by Lubantun, where it is found. And I think its rightful owner is the Mayas. So I think it should be back in its right place. I should think it belongs to Belize. That, that's my idea. I think it should belong. Whatever from here it belongs to here. It's, it's, it's a property of Belize, and I think it probably should be returned back home. And the time for that return may be approaching quickly. For many believe it is critical for the skulls to come together as soon as possible. The native elders refer to the period of time that we are now entering as the time of the awakening or the time of warning. So they believe that the skulls are emerging now to help us awaken, to help to warn us that we must change the course of humanity before it's too late. And if the conspiracy theory involving NASA has any truth to it, the U.S. government may be on the hunt, too. We will build new ships to carry man forward into the universe, to gain a new foothold on the moon, and to prepare for new journeys to the worlds beyond our own. On January 14, 2004, President Bush declared that the United States would set up a space station on the moon by the year 2015. Richard C. Hoagland thinks our renewed interest in the moon has to do with his theory that Apollo astronauts found a robotic head on the moon that may be related to the crystal skulls. Is it possible that the reason we're all suddenly rushing back to the moon now is that after 40 years, the folks at Area 51 with expertise from Caltech and MIT and Los Alamos figured out how to talk to this thing and it told them of the extraordinary wonders that are waiting on the moon. Meanwhile, back in Honduras on the island of Helene and with the pressure on, Bill Holman and Ron Ryan think they're close to the underground caves that may contain a crystal skull. Well, there's an opening up high. Yeah. Pushing further up the mountain, they find an entrance to a cave remarkably like the one in the Mitchell Hedges photograph. It's guarded by a huge tarantula. A bat just flew on my back. Bill is on full alert. He's never been so deep underground. This cave is a very tight fit, and there are bats, spiders, and poisonous insects at every turn. In caves such as this one, the ancient Maya conducted arcane rituals and even human sacrifice. Who knows what Bill and Ron may come upon next, but they don't give up. The descent is becoming dangerous. Ron almost falls off a crumbling ledge. Okay. But they continue until they can go no further. Hey, Ron, if you were here, where would you put the crystal? Where would be a good place to hide it? Well, I'd probably go down the smallest, deepest hole I could find, and where I'm standing here is actually, I can see down this hole over here quite a ways, but boy, I couldn't get in there. And uh, probably if I really wanted to hide it, I would have put it down in that hole and then just buried it again. But if there is a hole below, it's almost impossible to get to it. The entrance is sealed over. It's solidified in there, so it's uh, almost like somebody poured cement on top of it. So, I mean, that would be a perfect spot to hide something like that. If something is hidden, there is no way to get to it without blowing a hole through the rocks with dynamite. And that approach could destroy the site completely. Basically blasting, uh, getting underneath this floor here. 
Strange as it seems, there may be another reason not to continue. Like the buried treasure in Roatan, if there is a crystal skull here, Bill half-jokingly believes it actually may have a curse upon it. They said it was enchanted, that's why they left it here. Oh. And maybe uh, maybe the gods are, are putting the protection on it, what do you think? I would believe that, I would think so. It yeah. probably belongs here and that's where it wants to stay. Bill once again returns to Belize and to his friend, Leonardo Okul. Because Leonardo trusts Bill and throughout this adventure has found him worthy, he is about to reveal an incredible secret to him. There is a sacred ancient place, a holy site known only to the Maya of this region, a place that holds an ancient crystal skull. This will truly be Bill's last chance. Up next, what no outsider has ever seen, a ruin overgrown, all but lost to the forces of time. Can ancient rituals help us find another skull? <laughs> and prevent a prophesied Armageddon when Mystery of the Crystal Skulls continues. It's Bill's last day, and though he has come up empty after crawling through dank and dangerous caves, things may be about to change. Remember before his trip to the Bay Islands, his Mayan friend Leonardo Okul had told him an amazing secret. Leonardo told me that there was a crystal skull buried in a chamber. So uh, I'm not saying that, you know, we can walk right up there and get it because, you know, it's, it's going to be very, very hard going and very impenetrable. Finally, Leonardo has decided that Bill is ready and is taking him deep into the jungle and back in time to a sacred site known only to the local Maya here. The location is just a few miles from Lubantun. There's only one problem. The ruin is completely covered by jungle. Leonardo has brought a team of local workers to cut through it. This is one of your special places just for the Maya. Exactly. Not that many people know about it. It's really hard to get here. That, I know. That's exactly. So. This is a very special sacred place for the Maya. It um, looks like yeah. Bill is standing at the bottom of a hill. Actually, he's standing at the bottom of an ancient Maya temple, overgrown by centuries of jungle. Local legends say that here, the Maya prayed to crystal skulls and used them in special rituals. Apparently, when an old medicine man was getting too old to carry on his work, they would lie down with the crystal skull and put their hands on it, and a young apprentice who was appointed to take over from the medicine man would kneel over them and put their hands on the skull. And during the ceremony, while rites were being chanted, the old one would pass away and all their knowledge and wisdom would be passed through the crystal skull to the young apprentice. As they near the site, Leonardo gathers incense made from the bark of a sacred tree. It will be used in a purification ceremony. It's an incense that is very powerful, that is more referred as the food of the gods. And they are around us, they are here. And in a way, it's a way how to communicate directly to the dimension of the word of God. They continue the climb, but it's getting tougher. The humidity is staggering. Finally, they reach the top. Below them, the valley spreads out to infinity. The skies above lead to their gods. This spot, steeped in potent ancient mysteries, is revered by the local Maya. To them, this may be the holiest site in Belize. And though we can only see a tiny portion, barely revealed beneath the encroaching jungle lies an ancient and sacred stone altar, one never before seen by Western eyes. We are standing on the sacred Mayan site and the area where the, most of the ceremonies have been done here. Leonardo marks the occasion by reciting an ancient Maya prayer. This place is the holiest uh, ceremonial center of this ancient Maya. This circle is made in the form of a cross. The north, the south, the east, and the west. This site here is one of the most holiest 
areas. It's similar to the Garden of Eden that we heard in the Western world. Leonardo believes that beneath them, somewhere within this pyramid, there is another crystal skull resting in a secret chamber. The energy is here. The energy, yes, yeah. I'm sure. You can feel a very holy place. Bill feels that he has come close to finding a lost skull hidden somewhere below him. In the movies, Indiana Jones might actually dynamite the site to gain entrance to the temple below. But here, Bill is stymied by the impenetrable jungle, stone walls, and strict laws protecting archaeological sites. Meantime, Bill carefully removes the replica as Leonardo lights a fire and incense is burned to the Maya gods. Inspired by the moment, Bill decides the time is right to give Leonardo one of his most precious possessions, a perfect copy of the Mitchell Hedges skull. What I feel it is a way that I can tie the people of the world with the Mayan people together. And I would like you to keep this replica skull for me so we can keep our energies together and work for the good of all mankind. Thanks a lot, Bill. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. For Bill, it's been quite an adventure. He has found three places where missing skulls may lie. One at this sacred place, one at the ruins of Ushmantun, and another in the deep caverns of Helene. Those will have to wait for a future expedition. But in the meantime, he has no regrets. The excitement of it, the, you know, the not knowing the adventure, it was just all there. Mitchell Hedges said, life without adventure is not worth living. And getting that feeling and, and being a part of that, it was just unbelievable. Our search for the truth behind the crystal skulls ends where it began, here in Lubantun, site of where the first crystal skull was allegedly discovered. Are the skulls ancient Mayan artifacts or 20th century fakes? Could they have been left behind by a highly advanced Atlantis civilization, as Mitchell Hedges believed? We found evidence supporting each theory, but the real tests may come in 2012 with its threat of an apocalypse. And as each Indiana Jones movie ends with a cathartic scene of the sacred powers of a relic unleashed, so too may the powers of the crystal skulls be unleashed for good or evil. And if an apocalypse of earth-shattering proportions will finally engulf the world in 2012, as the crystal skull legends predict, then the Maya have named this place appropriately. For in the Maya language, Lubantun means the place of the falling stones.